So, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, session of the Literary Festival. Um, it's about uh, a novel that is uh, a novel about uh, very significant episodes of uh, uh, Macau's history. And uh, here we have uh, a very, very rare combination of uh, a novel that in itself is very significant historically and the author has his own historical pedigree. Uh, Marco Lobo is uh, part of a family that uh, uh, was, that still is, but it was basically very, very influential uh, during the, the, sec the 20th century uh, in Macau. Uh, Marco's uh, grandfather, Pedro José Lobo, you can see his name on the streets here in Macau. Uh, in the 30s, he was uh, the director of the economic department here uh, in Macau, but uh, his uh, influence was uh, uh, much larger than the title could suggest. He was basically the person that, along the years, for several decades, was uh, um, the closest advisor to successive uh, governors. He had a very, very important role during the, um, the World War II periods when um, he had to use all his diplomatic skills to uh, talk to the Japanese, to talk to the British intelligence and, and, and the diplomats here to try to make this uh, small city keep being neutral during World War II when there were so many people uh, interested in uh, making uh, a lot of trouble uh, uh, in this uh, small city um, in the Far East. So for me, it was quite a surprise to realize that there was a Marco Lobo uh, that was such a good writer. I came across this novel not too long ago, and of course, I immediately thought that uh, Marco had to be uh, a guest of the Literary Festival and this novel that was only published in English had, of course, also for its quality and for the fact that it's so important also in terms of uh, Macau's history studies and so on, this novel should definitely be translated to Portuguese and to Chinese as well. Um, we did a very, very... Um, big effort to make things happening in time. Uh, you can see the results. Uh, we have published the first edition of this book. Uh, we are planning to do uh, further editions, eventually uh, with uh, art cover, eventually with some more documents to enrich uh, this uh, excellent work by Mark Lobo. Before, uh, we talk about the, the novel. I think it would be important to read it a little bit for you to have an idea of uh, what is it about and the kinds of writing uh, that Marco used uh, in this work. So we are going to have uh, excerpts, uh, the same excerpt first in English by Marco 
Dan in the uh, Chinese by Zhou Tang. He is the, the author of the preface of the Chinese edition. He helped also with the proofreading. And then Teresa Sena uh, with the Portuguese. She did exactly the same role in the Portuguese edition. So, Marco Lobo, please. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's really a pleasure. I'll um, speak a little bit more, but now I'll just start with, with, the, with the reading. Okay. Vicente didn't know how long he'd been sitting there. A near-empty bottle of port on his desk was no help. It might take a whole day to drink a full bottle, but he'd also managed it in a couple of hours. No matter. How long is a piece of... a piece of shit? he whispered, stifling a giggle with a palm of his hand. Leaning forward, he pinched the stem of a little glass on his desk and brought it to his dry mouth. He smacked his lips at the drink's sweetness, enjoying the mild burn as it went down. And now, time for a little medicine? he asked himself. He set the glass down and jerked open his desk drawer halfway. A little brown bottle rolled forward. At one time, it did contain medicine, but the doctor who prescribed it long since passed Vicente kept refilling the bottle with laudanum. The rolling flask pushed something along with it. A note doubled over and over until it was a thick wad incapable of another fold. The kind of thing you might do to hide a note away, keeping it from one's own eyes, and yet too precious to discard. Though he'd sat at this very desk each day, he had no recollection of what the note contained. He picked up the wad and unraveled it, bringing the creased paper close to his eyes. He recognized his own handwriting, the hand of a much younger Vicente Nicolau de Mesquita. He began to read, sounding the words out in his head. Sixteen silver, Mexican silver dollars. What the devil, Vicente said. He went to the next line. One gold watch and chain. Ah, yes, yes. Now he remembered a list of what was to be a final testament, if he was complete, to be completely honest about it. Something he'd scribbled 30 years before. Poor sod, he said of himself before going on. One military saber. One pair of regulation dress boots. One oil painting depicting Chinese fishermen by the artist George Chinnery. Vicente glanced forward towards a painting across the room where a blurry shape hung on the wall. He gave up trying to read the strain on his vision, an excuse to escape the discomfort of considering his transience. Vicente looked longingly at the bottle in the desk drawer. Not now, he shook his head. Later, after, after the parade, he threw the open note into the drawer and banged it shut. Okay, now it's a Cantonese version, huh? 卫生达不知道他在厕所几久台上有一尊几乎饮晒的波特酒但这个判断不到时间饮晒一支酒有时会用成日不过几个钟都不是很可能没所谓这个有几长这张顶啊他低声地说饮住嘴没说出声他轻
，佢醒起，因為將清單或者直白啲講係一份遺囑，係三十年前匆匆咁樣寫低。唉，真係可憐。佢諗起當年嘅自己，然之後繼續睇落去，佩劍一把，軍靴一雙。喬治潛力嚟畫中國油膚油畫一幅，維新特望咗一眼對面嘅牆，朦朧之間佢見到一幅畫嘅輪廓，佢冇墮落去，眼睛太辛苦，只係藉口。真正嘅原因係佢諗到咗短暫已逝嘅青春，生生不快。維新特眼紅咁樣望住櫃桶入邊嘅藥樽，而家唔食得，佢擰下頭，一陣咧，等遊行結束咧，佢將打開嘅紙仔。掉落去櫃桶 b a n 咁樣一聲，收埋咗。Vicente não sabia há quanto tempo estava ali sentado. A garrafa de Porto quase vazia na sua escravaninha não ajudava. Poderia levar um dia inteiro a beber uma garrafa. Mas também já tinha sido capaz de lhe fazer em escassas horas. Indiferente. Qual é o tamanho de um, de um pedaço de merda? Sussurrou, abafando um risinho com a palma da mão. Inclinando-se para a frente, pegou no pé de um cálice que estava sobre a escrivaninha e levou à boca ressequida. Estalou com os lábios ao sentir a doçura do vinho. Usando o leve ardor que provocava ao deslizar para o seu corpo. E agora a hora do remédio? Disse. Pousou o cálice e puxou aos chafanões a gaveta da escrivaninha que ficou entreaberta. Um pequeno frasco castanho rolou para a frente. Contivera em tempos um medicamento. Mas como o médico que o prescrevera já estava morto há muito tempo, Vicente enchia-o continuamente de laudano. O frasco cilíndrico vinha com algo atado, uma nota dobrada e redobrada até se tornar um maço grosso, impossível de voltar a dobrar. O tipo de coisa que se faz para esconder uma nota longe da própria vista e, no entanto, demasiado preciosa para se livrar dela. Apesar de todos os dias se sentar naquela escrivaninha, não tinha a menor memória sobre o conteúdo da nota. Pegou no maço e desenrolou-o, chegando o papel amarrotado para junto da vista. Reconheceu a sua própria caligrafia. A de um Vicente Nicolau de Mesquita muito mais jovem. Começou a ler, fazendo as palavras ecoar na sua mente. 16 dólares de prata mexicana. Que diabo, disse Vicente. Passou para a linha seguinte. Um relógio de ouro e uma corrente. Ah, sim, sim. Lembrava-se agora, em boa verdade, de uma lista. Daquilo que viria a ser um testamento. Algo que escrevinhara 30 anos antes. Tch, 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 pobre tipo. Disse sobre si mesmo antes de prosseguir. Um sabre militar, um par de botas de cerimónia regulamentares, uma pintura ao óleo retratando pescadores chineses de George Henry. Vicente relanceou um retrato do outro lado da sala, onde uma forma desfocada pendia da parede. Desistiu da tentativa de leitura, com a tensão ocular a servir de desculpa para evitar o desconforto de pensar na sua transitoriedade. Olhou com desejo para a garrafa guardada na gaveta da escravaninha. Agora não, meneou a cabeça, logo depois da parada. Atirou a nota aberta para dentro da gaveta e fechou-a com estrondo. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Joe, for, for the reading. Um, as I said, they were uh, the preface authors and they were also responsible for the proof reading. Uh, regarding the translation for Chinese, it was made by Stacy Chow, who is over there. And made uh, excellent work in a very short period of time. Thank you so much. Uh, the Portuguese one was by Sofia Castro Rodrigues, who is uh, in Portugal, of, uh, could not uh, join us here. There was also another person involved uh, in this project, who is a, a local artist called Philippe Gorge, who is uh, over there and is. Uh, <laughs> 
the author of this uh, painting uh, that was uh, based uh, on uh, illustration that it was published at the London uh, Illustrated News in 1849, right after the assassination of uh, the governor Ferreira do Amaral. So we asked Philippe to do this uh, uh, painting after that illustration. It is an uh, anonymous illustration. We don't know who was the author. Anyway, it's here and it was uh, the base for the cover of uh, these books. Uh, thank you again, Philippe, for your excellent work again. Um, and um, now it's time, Marco, for you to do a presentation of your book and to uh, let us know about the background. Okay. Thank you very much again, everybody. Uh, a very special thank you to my collaborators and to Ricardo, my publisher, and for my cheerleading squad sitting in the front here, who have come all the way from Panama and the US and everywhere. But anyway, so I'm going to today give you a little bit of a, a, the, the, the background today. On the screen here, you've got the, uh, this lovely reproduction of what appeared on the Illustrated London News. And it's a picture of the governor, Amaral, holding the reins of a horse in his mouth so he could use his one arm to strike down at his assassins. And uh, as you'll see later on, this is, is part of a, a very interesting tale. So this is what we'll, we'll do today. And I'll speak quite quickly because time is, is limited. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background uh, uh, talk a little bit about the motivations of writing the novel. Uh, and I've, I've, I've called this presentation Perfect Storms, and there are two perfect storms in this. The first one happened in 1849, where there was the famous battle, and Vicente went and attacked the Chinese fort at Basileon uh, by Shaling. And the second perfect storm uh, in 1966, when uh, the, 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 the statue of Vicente Mesquita was torn down as part of the, uh, the, the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So I'll, I'll begin. Uh, a little bit about myself. I live in Tokyo, in Japan. Uh, I consider myself part of an ongoing 500-year history of spreading the, the Portuguese diaspora uh, in Japan, in that country. Um, and as you can see, uh, our claim to fame was trading technology. In those days, we sold guns, and we did it pretty well. So what sparked my curiosity about this? Um, as a businessman, as an economist, we look for anomalies. And in, uh, since 1557, there were 47 captains major in Macau. These were people who came for a year or two and basically were to make money for the crown and for themselves. And they traded in, in uh, uh, the Spice Islands and Japan and across Asia. After that, there were 120 governors between 1623 and 1999. So what caught my eye here was the anomaly. And we see that in the 74th governor, which was João Maria uh, do Amaral, he was, you know, he lasted uh, 1,200 days. But after that, there was almost a full year where there was nobody in Macau. So that sparked my interest. It was not the first time in history it's happened, but and I, I looked into the reasons for the previous ones, but this one drew my attention. Then somebody was sent, eventually, from Portugal. He lasted only 38 days. There's another story in that, and that's what I'm writing now, but this one is uh, about uh, the earlier one. So I went to investigate this, and this was where I developed this, this storyline. The first storm in 1849, um, the second, uh, there, there was a period of between the storms in the 1940s, and you see this, I won't even say gentleman, but I guess that's some, how some people would have seen him, Salazar. And then the second storm during 1966, and then you see what happened all the way until uh, 99 when the handover uh, took place to China. So what is a perfect storm? Uh, it's a catastrophic event resulting from a convergence of powerful phenomena, and I'm going to describe those powerful phenomena to you. Um, who are the players? The Chinese Emperor Daogong. Uh, China was very weakened at the time. Uh, they had been, uh, they'd lost, just lost uh, seven, eight years before, 20,000 troops in the first Opium War. 
Um, they were emotionally humiliated also, and their finances were drained by a huge increase of opium entering the country and an outflow of silver. So uh, lots of things happening to weak, weaken the country. External threats were uh, uh, Hong Kong was handed over uh, as part of the, the Nanking uh, Treaty in, in 1842. It was the first time that a, a piece of Chin Chinese sovereign territory was uh, given away to a foreign power. Um, you had the French in Vietnam, they had treaty ports in Ningbo and Guangzhou, uh, and you also had an internal threat. And, and I'm going to speak a little bit about this internal threat. Uh, at the, if, if you've heard of the, the, the Taiping Rebellion, which was for eight years from, 19, from 1850, Macau had a great deal to play in that because it was a, a printer, a Protestant missionary by the name of Morrison in the early 1800s who established a printing press and translated Christian texts into Chinese. These were brought into China and a Christian army was formed that eventually threw, uh, almost threw over the Qing government. So Macau had a, was punching way above its weight way back then. In this story, who are the players? <coughs> the queen, queen of Portugal. Portugal was also weakened. It had lost Brazil. Um, there was a challenge to the throne. Napoleonic Wars had devastated its military and navy. It relied heavily on Britain. Then you have a new governor coming to, to Macau, uh, and he was an ambitious warrior who had lost his arm in the war of, over Brazil. He had something to prove. Um, Great Britain, he used as a model. If Britain can do this and humiliate China and steal some territory or take territory through warfare, I want to do the same. Um, and that's what he did. I mean, if you know the background, he, he did a lot of things to try and, and, and aggravate China. Uh, and then our main player in this tale is Vicente. I call him accidental hero. And on the other side, uh, I refer to as a pot stirrer, was the Catholic bishop, um, Damanta. So here you have the players. So what actually happened? The queen says, give me some more territory. Amaral says, sure, no problem, how do I do it? And he goes to Amaral, uh, sorry, he go yes, he goes to Damata. And he says, Damata says, okay, um, this is Catholic territory. Let's uh, get rid of the Chinese graves at the borderline. That, that will certainly get people upset. That'll start a war. But let's not, let's not uh, pretend that we're trying to humiliate them culturally. Let's say we're doing it for economic reasons, something like open up the road, okay? So you have a, in, in the book, you have a small conversation between these two men. And I, I put this in here because uh, it's important in what happens a century later. Uh, you have uh, Bishop Damata saying, there's nobody, you know that if the Chinese come over the border, we will be swept away like pebbles in, in, in the water. And Amaral says, well, luckily there is nobody in China that can unite the people. And he was right at the time, up till 1966. This is what it looked like at the time. Uh, you had this narrow neck, and you can see that small line, which is where the, the action took place. Here's another illustration of what it looked at at, at the time. Um, just uh, luckily, just about at that time, I was able to find, find this, this illustration. So what was the scene? What was the, the, the background of this? So this is Mosquitoes Macau, the idyllic chinnery Macau, um, you know, a place that we all would love to have, have, have lived in. But that wasn't the only Macau, a, a real juxtaposed Macau against this. Uh, and as Portugal was the leading, preeminent leader of the uh, African slave trade, it was Macau was the biggest country in the coolie trade, which was slavery in itself. Uh, and I've read lots of different uh, accounts of this, but uh, the most recent one I heard, I've read up to 500,000 Chinese were traded through Macau. Um, and of course it was a century it was a center for opium trade until the British basically took over with the establishment of Hong Kong. 
Um, characters in the novel, these are minor characters, but still important ones. Um, the arch enemy, Breno, in my mind, he was also Bluto from Popeye. Um, you've got the tavern owner, Pearl. You've got Francisco, who's his fat friend. And you've got the Tautai, the district chief. Coolies, who are assassins. And you've got Gerardo, the butler of Amaral, who's also quite important in this. Okay, uh, some people might not like to see history this way, but I saw uh, the two of these men, Amaral and, and Vicente, as Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. And, um, you know, Sancho Panza, actually, if you've read uh, Cervantes, was not the bumbling fool. He was the one, the level-headed person who gave very uh, solid, you know, down-to-earth advice to his master. So it, it isn't all that bad for him. Uh, so what happens? The Chinese graves are cleared away. A bounty is put on Amaral's head. And then you have the action. And he is assassinated. Some people say six, some seven. Um, I hope you read the book and believe my account, because I don't believe these. <laughs> um, this is what the London uh, Illustrated News printed <clears throat> as part of that article. Amaral's death has caused universal regret among the foreign community. His vigor, courage, and firmness in dealing with the Chinese nation secured him respect and admiration of all. I'm pretty sure the Chinese didn't feel that way. Here's another after-the-fact illustration. Now, I did count about 40 people in this picture, but there's another one that shows several hundred, so I also don't, uh, I, 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 you may as well believe my account rather than this one. Um, so there were 400, pe 400 people in the fort that they eventually wanted to attack. And um, how did they do it? Well, you have to level the field with technology, just like we're doing in modern day now. There's a huge polarization of technology. How did the Portuguese do it? The Portuguese did it with the way they knew how level the odds with technology, the howitzer, okay? These are actually Spanish ones. I couldn't get pictures of Portuguese ones, but I'm pretty sure they were the same machine. Field guns. Um, the history book says there was only one. They fired a shot over, and the Chinese scrambled like ants, and they, the battle was won. I don't believe that either. Uh, this is what the Qing had. The Qing had long guns, probably flintlocks. Um, they probably weren't very uh, good uh, at firing them, and they had bows and arrows, which relied very heavily on, and r well into the 1900s, the, the bow and arrow was very well respected as part of military training. What did Pasaleon, the fort, look like at Baixaling? Probably like this. Uh, this is from a fort in, in uh, Tianjin. It was uh, built 300 years prior to, to this battle, and it was designed to protect the coast from uh, Japanese pirates, the Wukuo. Um, and I've written about that in another book. Basically, mud walls, uh, uh, you know, with the ability to defend against uh, weapons of the time, but not modern weaponry. Probably cannons that were erected to fire at a trajectory to fire into the, into the river. So I, I write the, the battle not as was shown in that picture. I write it as a land battle with troops rushing up the hill which I believe that's probably how it took place. Um, and I, you know, I, I gave them four howitzers. Um, so again, victory for Portugal over China, another military defeat. China is humiliated. And OK, the hero, four or 40 of you men went and killed 400 or destroyed a fort. Uh, you'd expect to be well rewarded. Well, what happens? Vicente waits another year, okay? Remember, Amaral is dead, so nobody can promote him, but when he gets his promot promotion, he gets one stripe on his arm. I would think I would be pretty irritated with that, too. Um, it takes another 13 years until he's promoted to major. Eventually, he becomes uh, a lieutenant colonel and then a colonel, which is the final uh, posting that he gets, and that's how we know him as Colonel Mesquita. Um, this is how I imagined the colonel in his later, later life. Um, and I describe him as a bear. Um, I'm very happy to have found that picture. But uh, read the book and, and be amused by it. 
So that's the end of the first storm. Vicente dies um, as, at the end of this storm in, in 1880. Um, it's a very tragic ending. Some of you may know this. He killed his family and threw himself down a well. Uh, the governor and the bishop of the time said, we're not going to allow you to be buried as a Catholic. And so uh, he was buried uh, in, in a, I don't know, unmarked grave or something somewhere. I don't know that part of it. Um, it took 30 years later, his, his old, oldest daughter petitioned for uh, him as a hero and got him, his, his body dug up and reburied in the Catholic cemetery. And now we know this man is a hero. <clears throat> so this is between storms. This is what happens. Uh, you have a situation where you have uh, Salazar in Portugal uh, selling tungsten or wolfram, which is what you need to develop strong armaments, and he's selling, because uh, Portugal is a neutral territory, he's selling to both the Axis and allies, he's becoming very rich, and he has money to uh, rebuild empire. And I think some of you who have grown up in Macau are familiar with this, this map. Um, and he's, he's basically saying, we're not a small country. Look how big we are. We are as big as Europe. And I remember my father being very proud of that, um, saying, you know, Marco, Portugal is not a lot small country. So um, that's the background to this. Uh, so statues were built. Um, one, uh, these two prominent ones, Macau, and even one of Salazar himself in Mozambique. Uh, wearing ceremonial garb and this particular one is now has been turned around it's not been destroyed but it faces a wall and it's a it's a it's a object of ridicule so then now you come into the second perfect storm which is 1966 and you've got the players Mao Zedong the great proletarian a cultural revolution and now he's the man who can unite the country and he storms over the border both in Hong Kong and in Macau, you have a new governor coming here and uh, he's fresh out of Africa. He thinks that he can treat uh, the situation just as he did uh, when he was running the African colonies and he starts riots. There is a really, really dark period in Hong Kong, in, in Macau history, the one, two, three incident where people die. And from that period of time in 1966, uh, de facto political rule was in Chinese hands. And this is from both my father and grandfather. And what happens next? Mosquito statue is torn down in 1966 as a result of this uh, very poor management of the situation. This is, I think, from the South China Morning Post. It describes a truck pulling it down. I actually describe it quite differently uh, with men pulling it down. Uh, better storytelling, I think. But then in 1992, this statue was taken down, moved to Portugal, and we, know, we all know what happens in 1999. So um, that's the end of the story. Thank you. But our history continues, and what's coming next? Thank you so much, uh, Marco. Now let's uh, hear what uh, is the opinion of uh, uh, Teresa and uh, Joe about the book uh, they're reading. Uh, Joe uh, is uh, himself a novelist, and by the way, he wrote a short story uh, that touches this same episode of the assassination of uh, Governor Ferreira do Amaral, a book that we uh, had the pleasure also to translate to Portuguese and uh, English. It was first published uh, in uh, Chinese and we uh, presented here a couple of years ago also in the Literary Festival. Teresa is also a writer, more non-fiction writer, she's a historian and I would start with you Teresa, what is the opinion you have about the book? Uh, I know it, you loved it, uh, can you tell us what is uh, uh, what your, your feelings about it? Yeah, that's an incredible book, congratulations. Uh, it's a very good fiction, very well conceived and written, dynamic, funny, and well researched, as we have seen. 
Okay, I have always a problem. I wrote it in the preface uh, because I'm a historian, huh? <laughs> so to, to establish the limits of the fiction. But I'm not entering uh, this now. So I uh, think it's a very uh, excellent and challenging contribution to the fiction, fiction on Macau. So it is fact, uh, uh, based on the historical fact and this background is well settled, except one or two importations that uh, uh, I find a little bit excessive, like the slavery. That's my opinion, because the coolest trade is another context. But I understand that it fits the narrative. Uh, it's a very good uh, insight on the, on the portrait of Macau of the, the time political, international context, we have the British presence, the Sino-Portuguese relations, and the peripheral, peref, peripheral, I'm sorry, situation of Macau in the context of the Portuguese empire, the coolies, the opium, the trade, the church, and so on. The characters are very well imagined, and uh, they, through them, you enter in the social and power relations, cultural and ethnic scenarios, and latent tensions, uh, the background tensions existing in Macau. What I found is, but this is not the proposal of the book, is that the political tensions of Macau are almost absent, absent of, uh, of the book. Uh, okay, you know that Amaral has uh, a strong hand, but anyway, that's something to note as a historian. But what maybe what I found more exciting is the exercise that you have done on the understanding and reconstructing the, the memory, Understand, understanding your legacy, and uh, the. Um, that's very important, and I would like to show something about this, is that the memory of Amaral in the, in the mechanism, the diaspora, was very present and very important. And you got it from, from that side, and you are questioning this memory and trying to re reconstruct it in a very, very nice way. So, um, I'm not going to enter uh, deeply on the other questions, but Macau, uh, Mesquita already had, uh, had um, inspired uh, another fiction, not so developed as yours, an interesting one, uh, um, short story that has been published here in the Macau Script World. This is only the last days of Mesquita. That's yeah, very interesting. It was, it was a short story that uh, uh, was part of the first uh, uh, competition we did of short stories and actually it won the Portuguese uh, edition of that uh, competition. So later on I would like if I have time to go to the uh, memories construction and uh, the myth of a uh, mosquito but I think now it's time to give the floor to Jilton. Thank you. Right, sure. It's a very good, very good book. Um, I, I uh, as just Ricardo introduced, I also wrote a story about uh, the assassination of Amaral. Um, so uh, I record, uh, like uh, I think it's the last year, but I was invited to uh, give a give a speech to um, a local middle school, which that school is just uh, along lo lo its location is along the, um, a very famous street in Macau, which is named after Mesquita. Uh, in Cantonese, it's Meifujiang, Meifujiang Dai Ma Lo. So um, I decided to change my topic a little bit, because I usually, because I talk about, about my novel, I talk about Amaral assassination, the incident uh, which just uh, Robo has already introduced. But in that uh, talk, I decided to slightly uh, adjust it to put the focus more on Mesquita. Well, I, I, I don't know Mesquita that much, but I, I, I would like to, you know, to talk with a student. So uh, I, 
I opened my speech by throwing a question to a, 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 middle, a local middle school, like uh, uh, the participants, nearly 100, 100 something uh, local uh, girls. So I asked them, what, who is it? Because you, if you put somebody's name on the street, Mei Fu Zhang, in, if in translate, Mei, Mei, Mei Fu Zhang Dai Maro, the Mosquito Avenue of Mosquito, uh, if you think it's a person, who is that? Who is that person? Um, I mean, I'm not, not surprised to me because during the past few years, I, 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 when I've, I've, I've been gave talks to the school, not much uh, students know about local history. Uh, but during that speech, it's none. Zero uh, girls, zero students know who is Mosquito. Uh, because I ask, okay, I walk into them, gave them my microphone, say, how about a guess? Who is it? So, and then a brave girl stand up and say, I guess, I think it's an uh, American colonel. <laughs> Because in, in Chinese, it says Mei Fu Zhang. Mesquita, the first character is Mei, a be Chinese beauty. Also, the same character as United States of America, Mei, Mei Gok Mei. So, they said Mei Fu Zhang is a, probably a deputy general or, or colonel from the uh, United States. So, it's, well, it's, it's very funny. I introduced to them uh, who is, and they are all fascinated about this this person's story, yeah, and says, so oh, they, they, after talk, they, uh, they surround me to ask, uh, ask the story about the incident happened in 1847, about the mosquito, about Amaral. So I, I, I would personally thank you very much for who for wrote this book. Uh, I, as a writer, a novelist uh, myself, I record one, uh, I, I remember from which book, it's, a, it's actually, it's a slogan from a publisher house, uh, for the historical uh, 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 novels, they write it and they say, uh, "What the job for the novel for the historical writers is to fill up the missing DNA piece in the history." So uh, the writers use their imaginations, their research, their their um, their uh, inspirations to fill up some because this. Mesquita is, is uh, I think it's a very famous guy in, 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 in Macau. So many streets named after it, uh, avenues, the streets, even the statue, or a little, his statue is gone. But still, uh, he left a lot of mark, traced mark in, in here. But of course, uh, the, 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 um, the um, how should I say it? The, the judgment or the, uh, the opinion towards this figure, I think it could be quite different from Portuguese community, from Chinese community, from local, local Chinese community, and from the, uh, from the uh, 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 mainland Chinese community. It was, we, we all, but it, I think, after all, uh, this book gave uh, 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 give me a very, very interesting uh, inside look because it allows us to see a person inside a person. I mean, after all, we are all person. We are all human being. Uh, and no matter what races we are, what nationality we are, inside we have same, same, same kind of feelings. We, we hate, we love, we, 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 we scare. You know, it's, it's, it's no matter, I don't know, maybe AI developed someday, we'll, we'll make that vanish. But it seems, when, no matter Portuguese, Japanese, Chinese, Macanis, we all share same feelings. And uh, those, those, I mean, this story tell us how he feel, which I, I because when I, I try to do my research uh, during my writing uh, about the story for Amara, but it's very, uh, I, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe there is uh, many resources, many uh, archives in Portuguese side, but in Chinese side, it's, it's none, it's none of them. I try to research and research, so after all, I gave it up. I, I, I did not put Mesquita in my in my novel uh, because it's no sufficient. I, and I, 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 because it's a real figure, I do not want to make it up. So I I, I make uh, my, make a, a fiction fictional uh, character, the uh, old Chinese servant, uh, alongside with Amaral. So I make the story go along that direction. But still, my interest arouses uh, during my writing, and this book just give me a perfect answer. So. Very good, thank you. Congratulations, very good, yeah. Thank you.
it is really not a surprise that this little girl did not know anything about Mesquita because uh, until very recently uh, no one was actually studying uh, Macau's history in Portuguese schools you would study uh, the history of Portugal in Chinese schools uh, you study the, the history of China or the history of the world and only very very recently uh, Macau's history has been uh, teached uh, in local schools but still not too many books being published and a lot of uh, taboo events that are not touched and this is one of them I remember I, I did some some work on the cultural revolution I was lucky enough uh, at that time to talk with some people that two or three years later were already you know denying uh, and declining any more interviews and so on it was once in a lifetime and that was it so uh, it's uh, quite normal that that kind of reaction happened uh, I was uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, surprised by knowing that you being a Macanese uh, being born in Hong Kong living in Hong Kong all this time you started your uh, novelist career by writing a book about Goa, Goa in the 16th century, about the Inquisition. But uh, when we go to the, your second book, and uh, as you said in a recent interview with Ponto Final, that you like flawed characters, you like accidental heroes, well, in that sense, uh, Mishkita was an obvious choice. I would like to, to ask you, how did you deal with this sensitivity, with the, the fact that you knew from uh, the beginning that uh, there would be many different publics reading your uh, novel and they would not necessarily have the same kind of approach to the, to the history and to the book. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the writers here will know that once you've got something out there, there is no protection at all from anyone. Um, we had a short discussion before. Uh, I have other writer friends and we meet regularly and they take their machetes and cut me all over the place, not literally, but attack my work. And um, I know that's going to happen with writers, but even more so with the reading public. Um, you have to be sensitive to people's views and not to be hurtful, but at the same time, if you have a story to tell and you believe strongly in it, and you have to write your characters in a certain way, so your characters have to be believable. Um, you know, if it's, for example, I mean, all of these things that happened, these were economic reasons that, driven, that drove them, but the effect is always personal. It's, it's the humans that are hurt, or humans who benefit, um, and everyone is different, and I have to stick to my guns. If this is a, 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 a very rough or a rude person, he's a belligerent, I have to go that way. I can't change the dialogue or something just because I feel someone will be hurt. Uh, because, okay, these are fictionalized characters, and they may not like them, uh, but if they are moved emotionally by them, then I think I've done my job in this sense. I want to add, add one uh, to my, my personal opinion. Uh, I, I just like the way you share, uh, you, you structured the story, not just on an incident that happened in 1849 itself, you know, it's also a one, two, three incident. Uh, because I think, yeah, I just said that Mesquita is a perfect um, subject to connect all the dots. Like uh, the, 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 I think the year 1849 is a very, very important year to Macau because that, what happened that year decided what Macau today is. I mean, the, the boundary, the, the, the border, and the, how, how big Macau is, and the way govern the, uh, uh, the, commu the Portuguese community stay, how they govern, how, how Chinese, how we uh, interactive. The, the, I mean, everything was set if, if, if we, we, we draw a line. That is the very important uh, year. And then again, uh, one, two, three incident, in, incident is an, another milestone, I would say, in the, along the Macau's history. So you are very cleverly, clever to, to, to put them together and make it an echo, I would say uh, like an echo in the history to make us a lot of, a lot of thinking. I think that is the marvelous Marvelous idea, and um, you know, my personally, um, actually, Mesquita is just across the street to my uh, office building, so I, I, I nearly walk 
walk uh, past him every day. And uh, um, when I wrote my first bo uh, 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 book, I I went there, went to the uh, to to see his tomb, and just you know you have a, you, you you just show a picture, his uh, statue and everything. Uh, but now I went there a second time after reading your book. So and, and then I noticed there is another um, graveyard and, and another uh, tombstone alongside Mesquita, which I didn't see last time or, or, or previously. It's a tomb, uh, Mes Mesquita's uh, wife. Um, uh, Babina. Bab Babina and uh, his daughter, uh, uh, Rosalina, I think it's, yeah, her, her name is Rosalina. And it was surprised me when I read the stone carved, uh, Babina, I think it's 80, 80 something, 40, 80, 60 something, the uh, year, the age. And the, another one, his daughter, I think the two, another two is uh, Babina and Mosquito's daughters. Another one is like 20 years of age, so young. I mean, it was um, surprisingly. And then it's the story give me feel of the thing after the name because for me it's just a name. I even I I even haven't noticed it. So when I notice it's just a name, but then there is a story. I think I think it's 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 for for me. I mean I mean here maybe uh, it's a question uh, for you is um uh it's, I I I didn't read actually I didn't read too much about it about the um, family. Uh, the family relationship between like his uh, or there is a wife and uh, uh, his his sorry his uh, first first wife and the second wife it's very very short then and the second wife is like they are not be happy each other and then the daughters you know they kill they kill uh, I, I I read I read the Chinese translation of the public government publication uh, after the uh, the uh, mosquito killed. Killed his wife, a second wife and daughter, and wounded I think another two, and then he killed himself in a well uh, in a Apo Jiang or right now, and and then government published a very short uh, notice to to, but there is, it's it's very flat tune, uh, very very just you know just uh, information to you to tell you what happened, but I, just I think it's four or five lines, but behind that I think there is a fascinating it's a. It's a human story. It's a it's a story. Can I don't know. It's a lot of things can can be declared there. So what what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, if I say that, and I'm going to say it, that writing that uh, final part about the murder suicide was actually, I don't want to use the word enjoyable, but uh, <laughs> uh, from a creative viewpoint. Uh, you know, you have to get into someone's head what is going to drive them to kill somebody. And what was his uh, frame of mind and what drove them to that point? Was it a sudden outburst or was it a long period of time? So I have to con construct the whole character and how did it actually happen? You know, it's not satisfying to a reader to say he killed his wife and daughter and he jumped down a well. I mean, so... Uh, uh, from that, from, from the creative viewpoint, you know, the creative process was enjoyable. It was obviously a very horrific scene. Uh, but yes, you have to humanize everything uh, if it's going to be <laughs> interesting for a reader. But that's that's my my take on it. Yeah, uh, of course, that's fascinating, and uh, that what makes Mosquito story even uh, better <laughs> in the, the <laughs> fictional point of view. But that's also very important in the construction of the memory. That's where I want to go. And the legacy of the image of Mosquita. Because uh, I did not have time to put it in a, in a framework that I would like to do. You have a, a period of recognition, even if... Uh, uh, some, some people think that the mosquito should have been recognized, honored in another way. And you have a rehabilitation period from 1898 to 1910. And in this rehabilitation period, you have to, uh, to, to, to think. I, I should have said something before. In all this period, in all this uh, movement of the memories construction, 
We have always the crossing and the a mixing of several elements. That's very important. The national element from the Portuguese side, the ethnic affirmation from the mechanist side and local side, and that leads to the discrimination uh, 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 sentiment, but also very emphasized. And also these problems, family problems, have been terribly emphasized, emphasized in the process of rehabilitation of Mesquita. All these uh, small notes that he was always discussing with the second wife, it was not so happy as like the first one, that he probably um, did not feel comfortable about, uh, about his position because uh, make, uh, people make jokes with him. This all came from the, uh, the, the um, testimonies, witness in the process of rehabilitation, of rehabilitation, and especially General Garcia, because he has wrote some notes and written notes about this, and uh, he was the man when uh, the burial, uh, the public burial, official burial was uh, forbidden, as, uh, uh, as uh, assembled all the officials to go and to follow uh, Mesquita Corp, uh, the tomb, until the tomb. Um, uh, okay, uh, remains, uh, to follow Mesquita remains. And this man has a very important role in the process of the rehabilitation. Because you could only have ecclesiastic, uh, religious rehabilitation if it was proved that he was insane. And so all these small details, these small stories that afterwards enter the historial, historical construction came from this part. And of course, the elder doctor helped said that they are always discussing and so on and so on. So it's difficult nowadays to, to separate. Probably was a very sensitive person. Uh, he filled uh, some problems and so on. But we need always to question this kind of information. So going back to the, to the memories construction, you have the proclamation from 1940 to 1966 as a national hero, the silence after the 70s, and now you have the questioning and the coming back to the memory. And, uh, and I would like to mention two, three points. Since 1849, diaspora has been very important in supporting Mesquita. It's it was through the Portuguese mechanism in Hong Kong that he received the, the sword as a reward for, for the attack to the Passalion. In 1898, we have the first move to the, to the rehabilitation of Mesquita, but it was a moment that the intelligentsia of Macau was very interested in constructing local uh, links, local links to the Portuguese uh, presence in Macau. The second one, it was in, uh, ah, but in the meantime, in 1906, you have time? No. You have, you have, a, um, you have um, a group of volunteers in Shanghai uh, integrated in the, in, the, uh, in the Shanghai Volunteers Corps, that was named exactly Companhia Portuguesa do Coronel Mesquita de Shanghai. And I have a picture of this. Okay, just to say, last thing. In, when is the national uh, proclamation, national from Portugal in the 40s, of Coronel Mesquita, it's not only because uh, the... Portugal was a little bit healthier at that time. It was 
the moment of the double uh, celebration of the nationality and the liberation from the Spanish. It was the moment of the consolidation of the regime established formally in 1936. It was the moment that it was important to show heroes in all the Portuguese world, as it was said. So, no questions to Marco? <laughs> no, yeah. Okay, we, we, we reach already uh, the one hour mark in our presentation. I would open to the floor for a couple of quick questions. Um, that gentleman over there, please. Yes, uh, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, Mark that uh, gave us a very uh, uh, kind of uh, food for thought, very uh, things that could give us more uh, inspiration to, to carry on this kind of, you know, topics. Um, let me get back to the question is when, uh, there, there are two questions. If you can answer me, I would be very pleased. Maybe other people would be pleased to know. Number one, uh, when writing this uh, novel, uh, do you have any uh, parts that uh, you initially want to put it, but uh, finally didn't put it? That means what are the deleted parts, but in the beginning that you want to put, but for whatever reason you didn't put it, if you have. Second question is uh, how long does, do you need, do you, well, how long do you need to write this book? From, from, from the zero to the beginning, and uh, what are the most difficult parts that makes you hard to write or, or struggle? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Uh, I'll address the second question first about timing. Uh, this uh, particular uh, novel took about two years to write. Um, and it went through a lot of different permutations from a lift. I, I, I originally wrote it in, I, I tried writing it in first person, third person. I, I did a lot of different ways of treating because uh, I really wanted to tell a story, a deep story. Um, I, uh, there, there are parts deleted. Uh, I, I wrote some scenes that were happening inside uh, Amaral's house where Mesquita was invited as a dinner guest and treated very shabbily. Um, I did not have any way to back that up historically or anything like that. Uh, and I just felt that uh, this is just too much, uh, you know, fanciful stuff. Uh, so that, that was out. Um, uh, yeah. The, the, I originally wrote, the, the first version of this was written f from the start of 1966 uh, and I gave voice to, uh, a first person voice to Mosquito's statue. And uh, Mosquito, I, I have actually kept it in in a different version in the book and it now is at the end. And the reason I didn't put it is because it would have been much too of a political novel, uh, talking about maybe the Cultural Revolution or something. I didn't want it to be that story. Uh, and so I, I completely changed it. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. There is someone there first. Then. Hello, uh, thank you for sharing with us. Um, a very interesting um, account and um, your heritage as well. Um, um, yes, um, my question is, um, of course, this character of Vincenti Mesquita is very important historically in the history of Macau. And as a diasporic person, I'm diasporic too, I can understand. How did you, how did the journey come about uh, to Mesquita himself. I've read a bit about the introduction that you probably, you know, walked through the statue many times as a child. But um, the name itself in Portuguese, I think it means moss, but if you if sort of a pun, the, the sound in Spanish, uh, mestiza, it becomes like 
next Creole, isn't it? So uh, with the diasporic elements of hybridity, you know, and, and, and the hybrid backgrounds, um, could you share with us a bit of your thoughts on this when you were writing the novel? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, I think I understand your question. Uh, uh, as uh, Ricardo said earlier, I, I, I'm very drawn to, to characters f uh, uh, who are flawed, very flawed characters. And uh, when I did some research into this, I thought, wow, you know, this is really amazing because uh, you know, I mean, who, who goes through this and becomes a hero and, uh, you know, and he, he ends up so tragically throwing himself down a well. I mean, what is this about? And um, then, you know, uh, other, other people, you know, other Macanese, uh, Jim Silva, I don't know if you, you know, ha has also written about him before. Um, and I was very drawn to this character and, and you know, who is this person? Yes. And you know, in my in my adulthood, this the statue didn't exist. You know, I was, I was a little kid when I'd seen uh, this statue around, and uh, so it's it was really, you know, the mosquito is maybe a bit like uh, who I am. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we're all as flawed as each other. I, I admit it myself. But you know, my my most the most difficult question I ever have to answer anywhere is when somebody says, "Where are you from?" I have absolutely no idea. I can answer that in 10 different ways. And I saw Mesquita as one of these types of persons, especially when you read accounts of how, oh yes, uh, I'm Macanese, that's why I'm not uh, treated properly by the Portuguese. And, uh, you know, growing up as, in a, in, as you know, my, my father, my grandfather, we were all colonial people. We were never attached to Portugal as such. It was always that, that big, mysterious power over there somewhere. You know, we're, we're people from the colonies, and uh, the, uh, Portugal always had this this mystique. And and I I can I, I, un I understand how Mosquito, if it's true that he was over, you know, passed over for uh, promotion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because he was of mixed heritage or whatever. You know, uh, you know, he's a character. I'm a character like him, and so I understand that feel how that feeling could happen. I mean, in this modern world, it's, uh, we, we, we don't feel that way anymore. I can, I can feel how in a, as, a, you know, as a soldier, a lowly soldier in a colonial power, that could happen. So I, I, I don't know if that's, that answers your question. So one uh, last question, uh, maybe afterwards. <laughs> I'm Mr. Lobo. First of all, I must say that I have a great respect for your grandfather and also your father two very successful people who have influenced Hong Kong and Macau. Yes. And then some small remarks. First of all, I don't think that General Nobi Carvalho was one of the, should be one of the acting players in the 1966 incident. six days after uh, the one, two, three incidents, he touched the, the, the land with his left foot. He arrived by hydrofoil. At that time, it's not just for hydrofoil. Then he, he arrived, arrived in Macau. He touched his, his, his foot. Or lift, if, if he, he first uh, touched the land with his left foot, which is very unlucky, to, uh, according to the, to the uh, Western, Western beliefs, you know. Yes. And secondly, according to uh, Father Manuel Teixeira, who is a very famous uh, Macau historian, uh, a priest, uh, Mishkita, he was, I just say, not very stable because he was passing promotions and very frustrated about his career and things like that. And the main reason why he killed his own family and then himself was because his single daughter, as an extramarital affair with a married um, military officer who, who, who lived next door to, to his house. And, and he, he uh, happened to live in a very religious uh, district in Macau, the San Lorenzo and Lilao districts, 
where all the, the uh, Macanese people, very religious, and he f felt very shameful about this, his, his doctor's you know, affair. And then in, a, in, a, in a, an attack of fury, he killed his, his own family, and then he, 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 he uh, committed suicide by, by, by uh, dropping himself into the well. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, th I'm not sure it was a question, but thank you for your comments. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we have to, to leave the, the stage to the next session of the Literary Festival. Michael Breen will come here to talk about his book, The New Koreans. Whenever we have uh, Macau's history as a subject, uh, questions tend to be very, very long and extended. Maybe we should next time have some more time for these kind of sessions. Thank you all for coming. And, uh, Thank you to Marco Lovu, thank you to Theresa, Joe, Stacy, everyone involved with this project. Philip goes as well. Thank you.